I just wanted to send a big thank you out to our community partners for this event, Congregation Sheriff Israel, Jewish Family Service of Greater Dallas, Legacy Senior Communities, Resource Center, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission and World Affairs Council of Dallas, Fort Worth. As always, we very much appreciate your support. My name is Annie Black. I'm the Director of Programs and Volunteers at the museum and we're happy to welcome you here today. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We do very much welcome questions during today's program. Um, since there are quite a few of us in here, if you could just do us a favor and type your question into the chat uh, as you come up with it. If you're looking for your chat box, it should be at the bottom of your screen. You just click that little chat icon, it should open up and you can type right in. Uh, if you are on a tablet or mobile device, it might be towards the top. So again, anytime you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to, to type that in and we will get those answered either during the presentation or towards the end. I would uh, like to introduce our speaker for today, Spencer Cronin, who is the program coordinator for the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, uh, a position he's held since May of 2019. Spencer received his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in history with a concentration in Holocaust and genocide studies from Clark University in Massachusetts. His research focuses on Holocaust memory in the United States and Europe, Holocaust education and contemporary anti-Semitism. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Spencer. All right, thank you so much, Annie. Um, and thank you again to our community partners and to all of you for being here. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do real quick is make is share my screen um, and then we will get started. All right, let me pull that up. Start that, and I'm just going to pull up the chat so I can see what you all are saying. Um, so like Annie mentioned, you're welcome to put questions in the chat as we go. Um, if I don't get to them right away, that just means um, I'll either save it for the end or it means I'm about to cover your question anyway. Um, so Holocaust education, the American approach. Um, just to give a little bit of background on where this presentation comes from, my research, that sort of thing. Um, so. A lot of my research in my undergraduate and master's level work in college um, was related to the Holocaust, Holocaust education, Holocaust memory. Um, I've really been interested in why we as a country are so interested in the Holocaust. Um, and education is a big part of how we remember any event, any historical event in society, if not one of the most important parts. Um, so as I was finishing up my bachelor's honors thesis in college, um, which was about facing history in ourselves, which we're gonna talk a, lot, a little bit about more later. Um, I came across this New York Times article, if it would let me advance my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, which has this pretty provocative title, right? Holocaust is fading from memory survey finds. Um, and we'll talk more about this in just a second. But a big part of this, this article is an attack on American Holocaust education, right? Um, so I kind of wanted to investigate, was this true? Is the Holocaust actually fading from memory? Um, so I set out to research the history of teaching and learning about the Holocaust in the United States, which eventually became my master's thesis. Um, and as it turns out, this is sort of a tricky topic. It intersects with Holocaust memory, popular culture, um, but also larger issues of education, the politics of education, history education. Um, what should we be teaching our students? And so rather than go really deep into all of that, which we don't have time for, um, I wanna give us today sort of a brief overview of what Holocaust education in America has looked like at different time points um, and really focus on and think through this idea that's so often repeated today that is Holocaust knowledge really fading or lacking? Um, so I want to take us back again to this claims conference, this article right here, which is based on a, a 2018 survey conducted by the claims conference um, that says there are some sort of startling statistics about what people know about the Holocaust. Um, and a big part of this survey's findings targets young people, right? So it lists statistics like 41% of millennials believe fewer than 2 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Um, many believe that Hitler came to power by force things like that. Um, and we see similar findings in a couple of other surveys. So there's one that recently came out just this past year in 2020 by the Claims Conference. But again, 49% of millennials can't name a single camp or ghetto. 
Um, 70 percent of Americans say fewer people seem to care about the Holocaust than, than they used to. Um, and again, so implicit into this messaging is an attack on American Holocaust education, right? Is this idea that we are failing to convey Holocaust knowledge to our young people. Um, and this is also a message that you see put out by quite a few major Holocaust education organizations um, in the country. So you can see on the left here, these are actually just posts that I grabbed scrolling through Facebook from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and you can see on the left here, we have this little blurb about Auschwitz, what it was, um, and then tucked away at the bottom left here is this 50% of millennials and Gen Z were unable to identify Auschwitz-Birkenau. So again, we're failing at, at educating our students. Um, similar theme on the right here, this one I mostly just picked because it features our own Director of Education, Dr. Charlotte DeCoster, um, which was always fun to see. So as I was thinking, as I was doing my research, um, and as I'm thinking through these, these studies and these claims that are being put out there, um, there are quite a few things out there that don't make sense to me or some contradictions. Um, so first and foremost, this idea that Holocaust knowledge is fading. Um, well, to me, teaching about the Holocaust has never been as popular throughout the country as it has today, right? There's between 14 and 16 state mandates on the topic, depending on how you want to define a mandate. Um, and you can stretch that out to just about half of all states in the country if you sort of loosely define it to be um, a recommendation, a council, something like that. Um, here in Texas, we have an entire Holocaust Remembrance Week that's actually coming up next week um, that's mandated for K through 12 education. Um, we recently, in just this past year in 2020, Congress passed the Never Again Education Act. So at the national level, we recognize that Holocaust education is critical, is important. Um, and more than just that, we're going to allocate some serious funding to make sure that it takes place. Um, so talking again about surveys, there was a September of 2020 survey of college students conducted by Echoes and Reflections that reported that 80% of them received some sort of Holocaust education in high school. And again, moving beyond that, there's numerous uh, museums and education centers dedicated to supporting Holocaust education. Um, so there's about 24 museums in the United Holocaust museums in the United States alone. Um, and by museum, I mean something with an exhibit, some sort of public facing content. Um, if you want to just talk about smaller education centers, um, there's dozens more than that. Some are attached to colleges, some are freestanding, um, smaller nonprofits that do teaching trunks, professional development sessions, that sort of thing. Um, I would venture a guess that you could find at least one in just about every state in the country. Um, so again, when we say that Holocaust knowledge is fading, um, the next sort of thing that comes to mind to me is compared to when, right? If you're, if you're saying that Holocaust knowledge is fading, that implies there, there was a time when it was more satisfactory. Um, and as I'm going to show us in just a minute here, proximity in time to the Holocaust did certainly did not mean um, that people knew more about it, or at least knew more about it in the way that we are defining as satisfactory. And in that similar vein, um, this idea that Holocaust knowledge is lacking among young people, um, my response to that is compared to what? So um, what topic in American history, um, let alone European history, because as we're going to talk about, the Holocaust is most certainly European and not American history, um, what topic would young people know more about? Um, so I would contend that a survey into just about any historical topic, whether that be the American Revolution, the American Civil War, um, or if we want to talk about European history, the Armenian Genocide, the French Revolution, what have you, um, would produce similar, if not strikingly worse results to what we're seeing in these surveys about Holocaust knowledge. Um, and then one more thing that I noticed in one of these surveys here that I just thought was interesting um, is this circled bullet right here that uh, findings show a substantial lack of personal experience with the Holocaust. And so for, for this survey, which is the 2020 Claims Conference survey, says that most percentage of Americans, 80%, have not visited a Holocaust museum. And I found it interesting that that's how we're defining a personal experience with the Holocaust. Um, in reality, in my mind, something like 99% of Americans have never had a real personal experience with the Holocaust um, and never will and would never want to. So furthermore, beyond that, why is it that we consider having a personal experience with a historical event critical to developing knowledge around it, right? So what does all this mean? Why are we so alarmed about this supposedly shocking lack of Holocaust knowledge? 
Um, and what I'm contending is that we're not exa- we're not actually upset about the numbers. We're upset about the moral implications we've assigned to them. So the Holocaust, and more specifically its teaching, has become synonymous with promoting moral values like tolerance, empathy, um, and appreciation for human rights, all these sort of cultural and, and moral values that we now see as critical to instilling in young people, right? So what this really suggests then is that teaching about the Holocaust has not faded over the years, but it's rather shifted in content and form to become this very different thing. Um, So what I want to do for the next 40-ish, 35 minutes or so is take us on a journey through some of these earlier years and earlier iterations of Holocaust education in the United States to show just how it's changed, um, but also some of these threads that are going to run all the way through the present. And what I think we're going to see is this very interesting dichotomy that what's causing this supposed lack of Holocaust knowledge that we're so concerned about um, is actually at the core of what is American Holocaust education, which is this teaching for moral transformation. Um, To sort of simplify that a little bit, I always like to ask myself when I see something Holocaust education related, um, are students learning about the Holocaust or are they learning from it? Um, So as we go through, there are a couple of sort of guiding questions and things I want us to keep in mind as we we listen to the next part of this. Um, and these were some of the things that I was thinking about as I was doing this research. Um, so the first is authenticity, right? What counts as authentic Holocaust education? How can we represent something as um, tragic, as enormous, as complicated in the Holocaust in a classroom, um, in a learning setting without somehow cheapening it, diminishing it, or trivializing it? And the second piece of that is authority. Who gets to decide what constitutes authentic Holocaust education and what counts as trivialization? Similarly, who gets to decide what counts as adequate Holocaust knowledge? Um, And so in a lot of ways, what I'm gonna talk about is as much a history of how people have thought about teaching the Holocaust um, as it is a history of what's actually going on in the classroom. Um, And so what does it really mean to teach the Holocaust in the United States, right? Um, Plenty of research, there's been plenty of research done about this that shows that teaching the Holocaust in any country um, is really shaped by different national histories, different cultural contexts, as it is with how we remember um, any historical event, right? So a really great simpler example of this is in Italy. So um, plenty of research has shown that teaching about the Holocaust um, in Italy has largely developed into a narrative that, a sort of skewed narrative that focuses on the nation's opposition to fascism um, while obscuring its role in persecuting and deporting Jews. Um, Because this is really a lot of the way Italy remembers the Holocaust, or at least its role in it. They remember themselves as people who resisted fascism, eventually overthrew their fascist dictator um, and worked to protect rather than round up and deport Jews. Um, So, I like to ask myself, what percentage of these students in Italy, which for all intents and purposes, um, has a much closer proximity to the history of the Holocaust um, than the United States? What percentage of these students could tell us uh, whether Hitler took power by force, how many Jews were killed in the Holocaust, that sort of thing? Um, So one last thing before we really get started is to think about some of these Americanizing themes that run throughout Holocaust education um, and really through Holocaust representations in general, popular culture, movies, film, um, some fiction books, that sort of thing. Um, You really can't fully understand how the Holocaust is taught without also looking at representations in popular culture. So some of the things that tend to really be staples in the United States are ending the story on a happy or redemptive note. So finishing by teaching about rescue or emigration to the United States by survivors or promoting human rights, teaching upstanding citizenship, that sort of thing. Um, An emphasis on the individual and their overcoming of adversity. If you think about the United States in sort of broad strokes, we really like the idea of overcoming adversity, um, of struggle and, and triumph. And then a focus on racism and intolerance. So you'll think about that. That's probably sounds pretty familiar. Um, teaching the Holocaust as this story of unbridled racism um, or what happens when you let intolerance run amok. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here and talk about in really to order in order to understand some of these different ways, different contexts and forms that Holocaust education can take. 
um, we really have to go back to it's really its first iteration, which is actually in private Jewish schools in the United States almost immediately after the war. Um, so just to sort of set the stage here for a second, immediately after World War II, private Jewish school enrollment undergoes this massive surge. Um, so it jumps from about 230,000 students in 1946 to about 500,000 in 1956. So at the same time that these Jews um, Jews in the United States are starting to expand their communities outward. They're moving from major cities into suburbs, um, where consequently they're surrounded by much larger non-Jewish populations. Um, and so why is this important? So suddenly they find themselves outside of more insulated communities where Jewish culture is a much more featured part of everyday life, right? And so American Jews are starting to be concerned, how can we get our kids to be instilled with a positive sense of Jewish identity? So school becomes a big part of that, um, and a smaller part of that is teaching the Holocaust. So I know what you might be thinking at this point, which is how is learning about the Holocaust, um, learning about mass murder, about victimization of Jews, going to get kids to be more attached to their Jewish heritage. And as it turns out, these private Jewish school teachers were thinking the same thing. Um, so instead of teaching the Holocaust as this narrative of suffering, of mass death, of victimization, um, it becomes, they frame it almost exclusively as a story of Jewish heroism and strength. So the main focus in these classrooms is armed resistance, whether that be by ghetto uprisings, partisans, um, that sort of thing. And there's also a huge difference in, uh, or a huge goal in linking these um, Jews participating in armed resistance in Europe with Jews in the Allied and American armies, specifically American armies. So creating this larger theme of Jewish opposition to Nazism. We fought the Nazis on all fronts in Europe, in the United States. Um, and so how do they do this? Well, they borrow heavily from Zionist imagery that's circulating in the newly formed state of Israel, right? Zew Jewish paratroopers, masculine soldiers, to emphasize this idea that the Nazis never broke the Jewish spirit. Um, so think about the, this is a little bit later, but this 1960 movie, which is based on a book from before that, Exodus, you know, this sort of daring Jewish paramilitary hero. Right. And so what this amounts to is one of the first instances of Americanizing the Holocaust in the classroom. Right. This story that's really about suffering, death, mass murder becomes this saga about freedom, democracy and anti-totalitarianism. Um, and so a big part of this was a desire to demonstrate that this new heroic Jewish identity is fully compatible with American culture. Um, and so if we think about American culture in the immediate post-war period, what are we very fixated on? Well, we're sitting in triumph over our defeat of Nazism and our victory in World War II, but we're also very focused on the emerging Cold War, right, and our competition with the Soviet Union. So that's why I said a little bit earlier, uh, anti-totalitarianism, right, because that can very easily become anti-communism uh, as opposed to anti-Nazism. So circling it back again to these checkbox facts and figures that we're so up in arms about, um, I'd like to ask myself again, how many of these students from these private Jewish schools um, could tell us how many Jews were murdered, could name different camps? How many would know that Hitler took power by force? Um, again, we may never know for sure, um, but I doubt that they would do much better today than our students do today, if not much worse. Um, so really, again, it all depends what your goals are in teaching the Holocaust. What you want to get out of it is gonna shape what it looks like. So, um, for a lot of reasons that we don't have time to talk about today, um, we're going to skip ahead to the 1970s and public Holocaust education. Um, so again, right around the 1970s, the Holocaust starts to become a much bigger part of American public life, um, and a big part of public life is public education, right? So one of the most important things to note about Holocaust education and the way it emerges in public education is that it's a grassroots movement. Um, so individual teachers, small groups of teachers start uh, covering it in their classrooms for different reasons, and then it gets picked up, it gets amplified, sometimes through organizations, sometimes more teachers start doing it. Um, this isn't a top-down thing. This isn't a state or the federal government that says we should start teaching this, right? Um, and I'm going to cover two examples of this phenomenon that also show some very different ways that teaching about the Holocaust can manifest. <clears throat> 
So the first is a unit sponsored by the Anti-Defamation League. So in 1974, the Anti-Defamation League, um, which had actually been producing Holocaust education materials for private Jewish schools pretty much since the end of the war, um, becomes aware that there's a class on the Holocaust being taught in a public high school in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, and what's so interesting to the ADL at this time is that there's almost no Jewish students in this class. So they decide to send an observer over to the class. They like what they see. Um, and they actually end up partnering with the, the class's teacher, whose name was Roselle Shartok, to develop a curriculum on the Holocaust that they can then distribute to schools across the country. And this curriculum becomes pretty popular. Um, in its first year, it reaches about 50 school districts in states across the country. Um, so to mark the release of this program when it comes out in 1979, um, this teacher, Roselle Shartok, publishes an account of it and it, as it's used in her classroom, which in this case was a 12-week uh, unit to a ninth grade social studies class. Um, and she publishes it in the Journal of Social Education. Um, and I got a hold of it, and it really gives us a glimpse uh, into how this unit unfolded. So what I'm actually going to do just for a second here is read a lengthier quote of how this article, of how this account of teaching the Holocaust um, begins. And I put it up on screen so you can follow along if you'd like. But, quote, the teacher drew the curtain across the window. The classroom darkened. A student turned on the motion picture projector. On the screen in full color appeared a pastoral scene of waving grasses and wild flowers. Then, Brown, barrack-like buildings in, a, in row after row behind barbed wire fences. The students in the ninth grade social studies class were puzzled. They looked around at each other, then at the teacher, then back at the screen. Color turned to stark black and white scenes, struggling people being crushed into railroad cattle cars, naked men and women with heads shaven, gaunt, hollow-eyed faces staring through barbed wire, showers that spewed gas, ovens full of ashes and human bones. Some shocked students momentarily averted their eyes from the screen. With each fresh horror, whispered exclamations of disbelief filled the classroom. Two girls held their stomachs as if ill with incipient nausea. The students had not been prepared for what they were seeing. There was no way to prepare them. The purpose of using this film was to introduce them to this period in history in as dramatic and interesting and authentic, and she actually emphasizes that in the article, a way as possible. When it ended and the lights were turned on, most of the students appeared quite dazed and unable to move. Some virtually jumped when the change of period bell sounded. So I'm going to pause right there for a second. Um, this is obviously not an appropriate way to introduce students to the Holocaust and hopefully not something that we see in classrooms today. Um, what she's actually referencing, the film is called Night and Fog, which I put up on screen here, um, which very famously has some extremely graphic footage from the liberation of the camps. Um, but you get the sense from reading this that she's actually quite satisfied or even proud of the sort of shock and awe impact this has on students, right? Um, and this sets the stage for the Holocaust to become this story of mystery and suspense. Um, and she talks about how the students come back to their next class with all sorts of questions, right? Who were the victims? Why were they murdered? Who were the murderers? Um, and what's interesting to me is that she seems, again, quite satisfied in not answering those questions. There's, so there's another quote from later on in this article that says, quote, by the third week, students were getting impatient because they still could not explain why the victim chosen was the Jew, end quote. And again, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, if you come to our museum here in Dallas um, and you go through our permanent exhibit, the first thing that we do is talk about the history of Jews, the history of anti-Semitism, so that by the time you get to Nazi Germany, you understand or at least partly understand why it was that Jews were victimized. Um, so again, we're getting the sense here of a very different type of Holocaust unit um, than what, especially than what we see today. Um, this unit very much positions the Holocaust as an event that's sort of out there, right? It's beyond the realm of students' experiences or understanding. Um, and the last part of this unit I want to touch on is probably what's most interesting to me. And that's what happens when they get to the end and start talking about this question of could the Holocaust happen again? Um, and here we see some really strong Cold War political influences. Um, so her students start reading sections of dystopian novels like 1984 and Brave New World. Um, they analyze the suppression of free speech in China and the Soviet Union, right? So the focus here is make it about making totalitarianism um, or the lack of freedom and democracy the most important precondition for another Holocaust. Um, and simultaneously, they're spotlighting these communist countries as the likely perpetrators of this next mass atrocity. 
So what are the implications of this, right? Well, first of all, it fuels a strong sense of it could never happen here in the United States, right, where we have freedom and democracy. Um, but if you want to take that even further, it's by promoting democracy around the world, which at that time meant waging the Cold War, um, we're working to prevent another Holocaust, right? So again, the general theme sort of running throughout this unit is that the Holocaust is an out there event. It's beyond the realm of what students can really understand or even experience as citizens of the United States. Um, and we wanna keep it that way, right? So now I wanna shift gears to talk about a very different Holocaust curriculum that pops up at almost exactly the same time. Um, and it, this one is gonna look a little bit more familiar to what we see today. Um, probably because it is still around today, and that is uh, facing history in ourselves. So in 1976, Margot Sternstrom, who is a, was a public, teach, uh, public school teacher in Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, gets a grant from the school system with fellow teacher Bill Parsons to develop a classroom unit on the Holocaust, um, which they call Facing History in Ourselves. So I'm not going to go too far into this, um, but the program basically spreads like wildfire throughout Massachusetts and pretty soon the country um, when the National Diffusion Network picks it up. Um, so by the early 1980s, Margot Sternstrom leaves teaching um, to turn facing history and ourselves into a nonprofit. Um, and it's continued to grow into one of the leading um, history and, and citizenship education organizations in the country and really throughout the world. Um, so I want to talk about how Facing History approached the Holocaust, um, and I'm going to talk mostly in the context of its earliest years in the 70s and 80s, um, but you can see many of these threads that still run through their current work. Um, so they begin with this idea that the Holocaust was not inevitable, right, but the uh, culminating sort of um, result of decisions of action and inaction by individuals in history. Um, and so already you can see that they've laid a little bit of a different foundation than what we saw in the ADL unit, right? The Holocaust wasn't this mysterious event. It was based on choices that people made. And choices are inherently relatable, right? We all make choices. And this actually eventually becomes the organization's motto, which you can see on the screen right there. People make choices, choices make history. So this is all part of their sort of broader goals in teaching the Holocaust, which, you know, to promote tolerance, democratic citizenship, upstanding behavior in students. So they argue that by learning about the impact of choices that made by individuals in the past, um, young people would come to understand the impact of their choices in the present um, and be inspired to make informed moral choices in the future. So another major theme of this approach, as you can probably guess, is an emphasis on parallels between past and present. Right. So the introduction of Holocaust and Human Behavior, which was and still is their main resource book on the Holocaust, though it's gone through a couple of different iterations since it first came out, obviously. Um, but the introduction of the, the original book, which you can see here on the left, reads, quote, any discussions of racism in the context of this study almost invariably draws parallels to racism within our own society and particularly within our own schools and neighborhoods, end quote. So their idea behind this is that linking this sort of particular history of the Holocaust with experiences in the present through sort of common themes will let students develop some more nuanced perspectives on both past and present. Um, so a really great example I got from interviewing one of the first facing history teachers um, was that during the Boston busing crisis in the 1970s, which was this really um, racially charged moment, um, teaching about the Holocaust gave him and his students um, sort of this pathway to have these discussions about race and what was happening around them um, that didn't spark sort of shouting matches or chair throwing, as he liked to remember. Um, so looking back to that ADL curriculum again, we see two very different examples of, of what Holocaust education can be, right? Facing history position the Holocaust as this event that's firmly in line with human history and sort of even the daily patterns of students' experiences. This is not to say that they're the same thing at all, but that you can recognize themes and patterns and things that happen in your daily life that were consistent with this history. So reflected throughout this entire approach is a very Americanized interpretation of the Holocaust, right? Um, these characteristics that facing history sought to promote, like tolerance, upstanding citizenship, moral decision-making, um, are all rapidly becoming important constructs of American identity. Um, and this is particularly true in the 1970s when um, this idea of a, a liberal multicultural education, um, moral education, really starts to take hold. Um, 
And again, these are some of the themes that we can see threaded throughout Holocaust education today, right? So just to give an example, the mission of our museum here, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, is to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat hatred, prejudice, and indifference. So I want to skip forward here to give one last example of how these ideas about teaching tolerance and empathy through the Holocaust become really ingrained in classrooms throughout the country. Um, and this time we're going to look at a film rather than a curriculum, and that's Schindler's List. Um, so like I had just mentioned before, you really can't fully understand how the Holocaust in American education unfolds without also looking at the Holocaust in popular culture. And I think Schindler's List is the perfect example of that. Um, so very briefly, because I think and I would hope we're mostly pretty familiar with the story behind Schindler's List at this point, um, but the film comes out in 1993, um, which coincidentally is the same year that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum opens its doors to the public. Um, but it comes out and it's a massive success, right? It wins several Oscars, it wins Best Picture, it wins Best Director, um, both of which had previously eluded Steven Spielberg, who was still a major filmmaker at that point. Um, and people across the country rave about it. So everyone from President Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, to Oprah tells people to go out and see it, right? And that's actually not, that's actually a pretty rare occurrence, right? You don't necessarily see a president of the United States telling people to go out and watch this movie. Um, but there's a deeper layer to this film's popularity beyond being just a very good movie. And actually, I think it is a very good movie, um, but it's also seen as this vehicle for moral transformation, right? Um, I mentioned that Oprah promoted the film, and part of her pitch around it was that it had made her, um, and it would inevitably make anyone who watches it, a better person. Um, and this has a lot to do, we, you know, we see this as sort of a, a general theme that runs throughout much of the reaction to the film, right? This is, you watch this, it's going to make you a better person. Um, and some of this has to do with the plot, right? We have this sort of somewhat ordinary uh, German man. He's caught up in this life of vice and he slowly becomes a, a selfless heroic rescuer and ends up saving thousands of lives. Um, so one review of the film reads, quote, this was a film that ultimately engaged audiences in a celebration of all that is best in humanity. Spielberg managed to establish a gratifyingly simple recipe for being heroic. Follow the golden rule, end quote. And so we even see this actually all the way down to the casting. Um, so the selection of Liam Neeson as Oscar Schindler, and at this time, Liam Neeson was actually a relatively unknown actor, um, was made in part to suggest that everyday people can accomplish extraordinary things, right? So we also see Schindler's List have a huge impact in the world of education. Um, it almost immediately becomes the go-to movie to show in your classrooms about the Holocaust. Um, and Steven Spielberg himself plays a, a pretty significant role in this um, when he decides that he's going to make the film available at no cost to any high school in the country that requests it. Um, and if you think back to the 1990s, um, when you still needed physical copies of films, this was a pretty big deal, right? So is the no cost thing. Um, when you think about schools that have... Um, less access to funding and resources and things like that. This is a great opportunity for them to bring this in. Um, and so again, the biggest part of this, this film's classroom popularity is its perceived ability um, to bring about moral change and to cultivate the moral values that we just talked about. Um, so think about how simple this is and convenient this is for a second, right? So you're a teacher and you're trying to teach this enormously complex topic in a way that also has a profound moral impact on your students um, when all of a sudden this film comes along and everyone says, it's going to do just that, right? Oprah tells me if I'm going to show it, this is going to make my kids better people. Um, and a really great example of this, actually, um, is in New Jersey. So in 1993, um, Khalid Abdul Muhammad, who was a member of the Nation of Islam, gives this very infamous uh, speech at Kane University that's filled with anti-Semitism. It's filled with divisive, inflammatory rhetoric. Um, and as a response to this, the governor of New Jersey decides that he's going to mandate the screening of Schindler's List in schools as part of this statewide effort to combat bias, right? Um, so the hope behind this is that it's going to show the dangerous consequences of racism and intolerance in the past and inspire students to prevent it today, right? And to get students to sort of identify with Oscar Schindler's heroics on screen um, and to strive and for, to get them to sort of strive to replicate that on a smaller scale in their daily lives. 
Um, now, there's all sorts of flaws to this approach that people have written a lot about, um, you know, some deeper sort of academic flaws with Schindler's List, um, and maybe we can talk more about that in the Q&A if we have time, if you want. Um, but the point is that this is sort of emblematic of the larger trends in American Holocaust education at the time, right? Teaching with this goal of um, moral transformation, right? So let's circle all the way back to the beginning and what we were talking about with these surveys. Um, if Schindler's List was sort of your main source of knowledge on the Holocaust, um, would you be able to tell us how many Jews were murdered in total? Would you know that Hitler had didn't take power by force, um, right? You probably wouldn't know many of these things. In fact, if Schindler's List was your main source of Holocaust knowledge, you might think that the Holocaust had a relatively happy ending, right? Sure, it was terrible and, and people died, but uh, it was also a story about rescue where every, where, you know, a large portion of people did survive. Um, and so while rescue obviously did happen and, and take place, it wasn't the story of the Holocaust, right? So as we wrap up here, I wanna take us back to the 21st century um, to talk through a couple of different other surveys and statistics here, right? Um, so a national survey conducted by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum um, in 2004 highlighted a sort of universal, a near universal acceptance of some sort of lesson from the Holocaust along these lines. So whether that's promoting tolerance in a multicultural society um, or aiding in the prevention of future atrocities. Um, and so furthermore, something like 88% of surveyed teachers said they taught the Holocaust from a perspective of human rights. And this is opposed to a historical, literary, religious, or geographic perspective. Um, so similarly along those lines, a 2006 study of Holocaust education in Illinois, which is actually one of the states where teaching about the Holocaust is at its strongest and sort of most widespread, um, produced some pretty similar results. So finding that the learning objective, quote, encouraged students not to discriminate and stereotype, received roughly the same response rate among Holocaust teachers as, quote, understand how and why it occurred. So as you can see, even by the time we get to the early 20th century, um, we are sort of fully in this effort to teach about the Holocaust as a means of fostering moral values, um, promoting greater lessons for society. And so we come back to this dichotomy that I was talking about at the beginning, right? Um, what's causing these supposedly alarming results about Holocaust knowledge um, is actually what we seem to value most about Holocaust education, its ability to bring about moral change. Um, and so from my point of view, there are sort of two responses you can have to this, right? And several people have, have written about this and talked about this. Um, but the first is that Holocaust education is working as it's intended, and we don't actually need to be alarmed at these sort of checkbox statistics that, you know, 48% of people can't name that 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust and things like that. Um, there's been, there was a, an op-ed recently written by Stephen Smith, who's the director of the USC Shoah Foundation, um, sort of as a direct response to this claims conference survey that says, um, you know, basically this amounts to fear mongering. Holocaust education uh, works and it's prevalent um, and there are studies to support that. And there actually are. So that ADL study that I referenced talking about how 80% of college students received some sort of Holocaust education um, was actually focused on tracking students who had received Holocaust education versus those who hadn't um, and sort of keeping an eye on their sort of moral development. Um, and there are some sort of statistically significant results that talk about how um, students who receive some sort of Holocaust education um, tend to be more morally developed, make more moral choices. Um, Facing History has done a lot of research and reporting um, around this as well, because again, that's sort of behind their mission in teaching this topic. Um, so that's one reaction that you can have to this. The other is that we need to um, radically reshape how we teach the Holocaust um, from the ground up, right? We need to refocus. We need to think about it as a historical topic, right? It's something that students need to learn about rather than learn from. Um, think more like a college history course, right? And I actually have um, one of my college professors who, who taught the Holocaust and is a um, reasonably well-known Holocaust scholar wrote this article where she talks about how um, secondary school students often, um, the Holocaust education that they get leaves them pretty underprepared to study it as a topic at the college level. They show up 
um, expecting to have conversations about racism or about bullying, about intolerance. Um, and instead they find this really sort of deep complex history that they hadn't been exposed to before. Um, so really in conclusion, it's not my place to decide which response we should have to this. Um, but really my goal is to, to help us get a clearer picture of where we actually are um, as we think about how we need to move forward. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pause there and see if we have any questions. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna go back and, and move through the chat. Um, um, from your research, can you tell if we will continue to see an increase increase in state mandates or other mandates around Holocaust education. Definitely. Um, I think this is this is a phenomenon that's only going to increase. And that's not a bad thing, right? I don't think that uh, learning about the Holocaust is a bad thing, right? Um, so the actually the, the Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week um, is really only came about as recently as last year. Um, so I think we are going to see more of these state mandates pop up. Um, and again, like I talked about at the beginning, we just see uh, we just saw Holocaust education sort of affirmed at the national level with the with the adoption of the Never Again Education Act. Um, so I think again, Holocaust education is only going to continue to grow. Um, I think the the question that we want to think through um, is in what direction do we want it to grow, right? Um, are there any resources you can recommend if we want to learn about if we want to learn more about Holocaust education? Yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that I referenced throughout this presentation, um, like that Journal of Social Education article and, and that sort of thing, they're behind paywalls and stuff. Um, but you can go visit the website of Facing History and Ourselves. They've become a lot more um, internet friendly in putting their stuff online. I actually think you can access their entire Holocaust and Human Behavior resource book um, through their website, which is really great. So you can look at that. And then I'll actually do some thinking. We tend to do this for events uh, and put together a, a list of resources, a list of things that I reference, um, like those op-eds, and we'll, we'll send that out to you all. Um, let's see here. Jenna, can you recommend, oh, we're getting, sorry, my chat's moving too fast. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Well, I missed it, but basically, can you recommend any resources about Holocaust education in Italy? Um, sure, there's actually a really great resource, um, and that's the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IRA. Um, and so that's the sort of um, international organization. It's sort of attached to the UN that is dedicated to teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Um, and they actually commissioned in 2017 this international study of Holocaust education. Um, and so they broke it down actually by language group and put together the state of research into teaching and learning about the Holocaust in all of these different countries. So uh, definitely go check out their website. They're absolutely going to have some country specific resources. And I'm sure you'd be able to find stuff about Italy. All right, here. Um, let me see here. What would your okay? What would your benchmark of effective Holocaust education be, and why do you think Holocaust education is so vital? So those are two great questions. Um, so as far as an effective benchmark, um, I don't think I have a definitive effective benchmark for what Holocaust education would be. Again, I think the the whole point of what I was trying to to get through here is that it depends on what you want to get out of it. That shapes how you put it, what you put into it, right? So if your goals in teaching and learning about the Holocaust are to teach about um, prejudice and intolerance um, and racism. You can absolutely shape a unit around that. Um, but then there are also, I think, some ways that are really able to, to meld these two sort of different positions. One that says our Holocaust knowledge is um, rapidly fading and we need to treat it like any other historical topic where you focus on what do you know rather than what do you feel. Um, and this other end that says we need, we need to be teaching these larger lessons. Um, and I think some of the, the middle ground between that is really um, inviting students to grapple with particular issues that are raised around the Holocaust, right? You can have these larger lessons, um, but ones that are actually stemmed from the Holocaust. So things like um, 
what is the role of powerful organizations like the Catholic Church in preventing violence and discrimination? Um, or things like, should political platforms that have overtly racist views be allowed in a democracy, right? I think you can still have these larger conversations and teach these broader lessons, um, but in a way that's very specifically derived from the history of the Holocaust. Um, and sometimes when you go through a unit on the Holocaust or you go through something like this, you end up with more questions than you do answers. And that's not always a bad thing. Um, I think a, a great part of Holocaust education and one of the reasons that it is so valuable, um, like the second part of that question asked, um, is that it really does invite students to think critically, right? It challenges a lot of their assumptions about society. Um, it gets them to think about things in ways that they previously hadn't. So I think that's really one of the most valuable things about this topic. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Um, how do you respond to someone to, to, who denies that the Holocaust existed? Um, and I'm gonna sort of reshape that question a little bit to talk about Holocaust education as it relates to denial. Um, so right around the 1990s, um, Holocaust denial has always been a thing, right? Since the Nazis themselves who sought to deny their crimes, um, Holocaust denial has existed in some shape or form. Um, but in the 1990s, we became particularly concerned about Holocaust denial. Um, from people like David Irving, who was sort of a is sort of a quasi academic um, that likes to put out sort of um, again quasi academic texts about why the Holocaust didn't happen the way we say it happened, or why we're exaggerating the number of victims who were killed. And if you really go look at the science, and you know the, there can have been gas chambers in Auschwitz the way we say that was. Um, so people really became concerned about this, um, and Holocaust education became a huge part of this, a way to combat denial and combat our fears about denial. Um, so things like Schindler's List, which like I just talked about, became this huge tool in Holocaust education. Um, People see this as doubly important now because not only do we need to teach people about it because it's important and because it promotes tolerance, um, but because people are saying it didn't happen. Um, so some of the other reviews for Schindler's List and the response to it um, really did frame it as this important piece to combating denial. Um, and I think there was a survey that some organization conducted in the 90s, might have been the claims conference, but don't quote me on that, um, that says that or that attributed part of what they saw as a rise in Holocaust knowledge and belief that the Holocaust did in fact happen um, in part to Schindler's List and its pop and its massive popularity. Um, let me see here. Uh, so Robin talks about how we are missing an opportunity to help young people understand socioeconomic situations and how Germany devolved into accepting the dehumanization of Jews and others. And that's a really great example of what I was talking about before with this way to teach broader lessons from the Holocaust that incorporate really specific um, issues and really specific questions about, you know, dehumanization and, um, the devolution of democracy and things like that, as opposed to more generic questions about racism and intolerance that you could just as easily teach from a, a dearth of other historical topics. Um, let's see here. Do you know if there were any studies done around Holocaust education in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or is that a recent phenomenon? Um, yeah, so it is a, a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, so the IRA, that International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, came about in 2001, I think. Um, so they were one of the first sort of major organizations internationally that said, um, not only should we be teaching about the Holocaust, right, that's one thing, but we should also be studying how we teach about the Holocaust. Um, and going out and, and collecting these studies um, is, pretty, is a pretty recent phenomenon. Um, and that's also part of the reason, another part of the reason for that is that it was, at least in the United States, such a grassroots movement, right? So it's really difficult to go out and write a history of this um, from the 1970s, from the 1980s, um, because it's in so many sort of different classrooms for different reasons. Um, and it really is a sort of decentralized history, which makes it a difficult thing to study. All right. Um, just going to make sure 
didn't miss anything else. And it looks like we are all set. So thank you all so much for joining us. I'm gonna stop my share um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Annie to close us out. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you being here. We hope that you'll visit our website, dhhrm.org to check out all of our great programs that we have lined up over the next few months. Uh, everyone stay well, stay safe, and we will see you next time. Bye everybody.